Hi everyone! Thanks so much for joining us for this Wednesday's Textile Talk. I'm Emma Parker, Project Manager at the Quilt Alliance, one of the six organizations that host these talks weekly. I'm really excited to share with you today we have an interview with quilt maker Lisa Ellis, and then we're going to have Lisa and her interviewer Katie Pasquini Massapus on to answer questions after the interview, which we recorded a few weeks ago. Um, but first, I would really like to thank our Textile Talk sponsors. These talks are 100% free to attend, um, and they are that way because of our sponsors. They have shown that they really care about supporting conversations, about textile history, about textiles in general, community, and learning. So we hope that you'll support them since they've been really great supporters of the Textile Talks program. As a reminder, you can please note that you can use the chat feature um, to talk with fellow attendees. If there's any notes you'd like to share there with everyone, you can put them there. Um, and we'll put extra information in the chat as well, such as links to anything that we mention. Um, after we show the interview, we'll have some time for a Q&A. And so if you have any questions for our guests later in the program, just put those questions in the Q&A box. Sometimes they can get a little bit lost in the chat. Today's interview is part of a series that we've been calling, Tell Me About the Quilt You Brought Today. Um, in this series, we show a QSOS interview, and QSOS stands for Quilters Save Our Stories, an oral history project started by the Quilt Alliance in 1999. Currently, there are more than 1,200 of these interviews that are archived at the Library of Congress's American Folk Life Center, and with our project partners, the Louis B. Nunn Center for Oral History at the University of Kentucky. Each interview starts with one quilt, which we call the Touchstone Quilt, and moves on from there to be about someone's entire life as a quilt maker. Tell Me About the Quilt You Brought Today is the starting point for almost all of these interviews, so we're excited to share today's interview with Lisa Ellis as one example of how amazing a QSOS interview can be. Lisa is a quilt maker, quilt teacher, and lecturer. She's also deeply involved in a number of nonprofit organizations that support the work of quilters, as well as the power of quilts to heal and transform lives. She's been an active board member of both Studio Art Quilt Associates, where she served as board president, and the Quilt Alliance, where she's currently treasurer. Since 2009, Lisa has served as chair of Sacred Threads, a biennial nonprofit quilt exhibition featuring quilts that tell stories of inspiration, spirituality, grief, peace, and more. Since 2011, it's been held just outside of Washington, D.C., and it's a unique experience to view moving and joyous quilts. I hope that if you're nearby once the exhibition returns in person that you'll be able to visit it. We're especially excited to feature Lisa's interview today because of an upcoming event that the Quilt Alliance is partnering with Sacred Threads on. One of our oral history projects at the Quilt Alliance is called Go Tell It at the Quilt Show. For that project, we collect three-minute videos of one person talking about one quilt. You can film these videos yourself and send them to us, or we'll work with you to record them. For this event, we're especially looking for quilts that fit one of the Sacred Threads categories, which include spirituality, joy, inspiration, healing, grief, peace, and brotherhood. We'll collect these videos, archive them in our collection, and then we're going to have a viewing party on June 18th where we can come together as a community and watch these quilt stories. I think it'll be a really fun afternoon of being together, hearing meaningful stories about amazing quilts, and if you'd like to learn more about either sharing the quilt story or watching them with us, I hope you'll visit www.quiltalliance.org slash storyshare. Now, back to our featured QSOS interview. Lisa was interviewed by Katie Pasquini Massapust, um, who's also a quilt maker and quilt teacher, as well as the author of many books on quilt making techniques. So Lisa and Katie have known each other for a while, and they sat down for this interview in April of 2021. Here's their interview. All right, hello, I'm Katie Pasquini Massapust. It's April 29th and it's 11-12. And I'm Lisa Ellis and I'm so excited to see you, Katie. I know. It's really fun. <laughs> Good to see you too. So we're going to talk about the quilt you have hanging behind you. What would you like to, to tell us? To, what would you like to tell us about that today? So this quilt, I call it Effervescence, and I chose the title because I was thinking of celebration and just with, you know, it's so colorful. And then also the bubbles kind of reminds me of champagne bubbles. So that's how it, I came up with the name. But this quilt is really important to me uh, for a couple of reasons. 
One is it's a significant piece in the current series that I'm working on, which is based on the cathedral window block. Uh, this was about the third large piece that I made in that series. And, but this one in particular is really important because of the connection that I have with Yvonne Porcella. Um, you know, she is very near and dear to us. And when she passed away in 2016, Cookie Bolton did a special exhibit called Live Your Brightest Life. And she challenged us quilt artists to make a piece in the style of Yvonne, but in our own art, artistic making. So I made a piece, not this one, actually. I made a piece for that exhibit. It was, I think they're like 18 by 26. Mm -hmm. But that is where I used silk. Because Yvonne loves silk mm -hmm. and wanting to work in her color palette and her style. Um, and I had a lot of fun buying silk fabrics because I had, didn't have any in my stash. We all love a good reason to go shopping. So mm -hmm. I bought a bunch of beautiful, bright, silks and I made this small piece and I called it church windows for Yvonne yeah. and I featured her black and white I did a border in the case of the smaller piece um, it's just a stripe black and white binding so after I made that piece I fell in love with that whole style the black and white the the silks and I really was still enjoying making my cathedral window quilts. So I decided I wanted to make a big one. So this is the one that I made that followed the one for Yvonne. And in this case, rather than just a black and white stripe binding, I actually made a black and white cathedral half block that goes around it. But it's in keeping with that part of the series of, of the black and white. Uh, so yeah, and this quote has been shown quite a bit. It went to, it was in the main Houston World of Beauty judged show. And then it is also um, in another exhibit called a celebration of color. And so it traveled with the celebration of color exhibit. Well, I just love the play, the contrast of the black and white border and the little, when you said the bubbles, the, the little arcs of the cathedral window that you did in the white really your mind connects them and makes it look like there's bubbles and these colors are coming through the bubbles. It's just really well done. Thank you. I'm very pleased. Thank you. So you say you work in series. I work, I've always worked in series and I find it's a really good way to explore an idea. What, what is your recommendation when people ask you about working in a series? Do you think it's valuable to do it that way? I mean, it is for me. Um, I find that from each piece, you know, I really learned something and, and it gives me just this jumping off point for the next thing that I wanna try. Um, I also like the building of the cohesive body of work. Uh, so for me, um, I have really enjoyed this because when I look at all of my work together, even though they're all very different from each other in one respect, it, the, it has a cohesiveness and that, that just really brings me joy when I see all my work together. Uh, so to me, it, it's really been a powerful way of working. And I've also, like you, I have worked in other series as well. This mm -hmm. is my Cathedral Window series. Yeah. Um, but I do find that is a very creative and productive, kind of both of those things. It, um, I find by the time I'm finishing one, I'm already thinking about the next one. And I think if I was going to do something completely different, it might be harder to make that jump. But because I do have these parameters around what I'm working on, I think it really helps me kind of get started on the, on the next big project. So I'm loving the whole idea of working in a series. To me, it's not boring. I mean, I've heard some people say, but isn't that boring? It's not boring. I think it's, it's really fun to explore the, the next thing. Yes, and then um, there's times when I go back to a series that I thought I had let rest just because another idea comes up with from another series and you can combine them. So yes, these, it's just a beautiful piece. Um, now, have you displayed this one, um, at your series as a whole anywhere? Well, 
just recently, I had the incredible opportunity to go to the TV studios of the Quilt Show. And oh. I have recorded a segment for the Quilt Show. And the Cathedral Window was one of the things that I got to talk about and got to do a little teaching segment. And so, yes, it was so exciting to see oh. all of my Cathedral Window quilts all together uh, you know, in, in the studio. Um, so yes, I, I did get to do that. But I, I will say that it is on my bucket list to try to have a solo show at some point and to have them all together, you know, in a museum or a, an appropriate gallery. Um, so that is on my bucket list of things to do. I think maybe I need a few more. You know, I don't know how many you need to have a solo exhibition, but I probably need to make a, a couple more pieces. And then that's going to be a big goal of mine is to have a solo show somewhere. How many pieces do you have so far? In this series, uh, probably of the larger size, probably about six. Oh, you're I have smaller pieces, uh, yeah. some studies and some uh, some samples, um, but I probably have about six that are, are pretty good size. Well, then you're close. Yeah. I'm close. Say eight to 10 pieces yeah. would make a lovely show. Um, so are you a member of different art groups, quilt groups? I am. I'm a member of Studio Art Quilt Associates. And you used and to be the president. You used to be the president and I used to be a president. We were both, we were both presidents. Yes, we have that in common. And um, that that's probably the group that provides the most for me. Um, I just get so much out of that community of quilt artists. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, it's such an important group of like-minded quilt makers that are all on this artistic journey together. So um, I just find that, you know, that's, that's a group that, you know, when I see the, the art quilts that our community is making, it really inspires me to, to keep going. And in fact, this quilt, one of the things that I really like about it is that it's more abstract and from you know Sakwa, there's there's a lot this is a more of a Sakwa quilt than a lot of my other quilts would be because it you know I do work like this is a block based quilt um some of my others might read more traditional one of the things that I love about this one is it does you know it, it does look more as of an art quilt because it has more of that abstract but getting back to Sakwa yes yeah, Sakwa is a very important group and then of course I'm also a member of the Quilt Alliance which is a completely different nonprofit uh, where we're dedicated to preserving the stories of quilts and quilt makers and I'm on the board of the Quilt Alliance uh, so that's another tremendous group that really helps us work together to try to make sure that we're saving these really important stories. Good. Um, are there other quilt makers in your family or friends that you quilt with or tell us about your social life around based around your quilts. So the first part of that with my family. Um, so my grandmother was a quilt maker. <laughs> And sadly, she passed away before I was really quilting. And I wish, you know, I'd had that time to really overlap with her where she could see and know that I developed this real interest. Uh, in fact, the Cathedral Window Quilt, what really started me on that journey was I unboxed a queen size cathedral window quilt that she made back in the 1970s. Oh, how and special. she made it the old style way with what I now call the origami method where it's, you know, you take muslin and you fold it, hand stitch the flaps back and then you add in colorful windows. And the quilt is fabulous because it's all these 1970s, you know, wild fabrics, different materials, not cotton. I mean, just, it's crazy. It's really beautiful. Um, so it was finding that quilt that I thought, you know, I love this, the overlapping circles. I mean, it really just kind of put it in front of me like, oh, I want to, I want to play with, yeah. with this block because I find it really interesting. So I do have that history uh, with my grandmother. My mom uh, was a maker. She did a lot of needlepoint, a lot of cross stitch, a lot of original designs of her needlepoint and cross stitch. Um, but never a quilt maker, never really sewer. Um, 
But then coming to the next part of that question, um, you know, I do have so many friends now that are in this quilt world. And I think that's one of the things when I think back over this journey that we've been on, that's where, I mean, my besties are all in this quilt world. And um, I'm really fortunate to have a second home in California that's got a really nice big work room, like a, you know, family room. And I have a lot of sewing retreats and I get to invite my friends to come and sew for a week and we just have a ball. And that's something I think really that's like the highlight of my year is when we get to have our, you know, great friends get together and just spend that time together laughing and playing games, but then each, you know, working on our, on our quilt projects. Um, so yeah, you know, really my dearest, closest friends these days are people that I've met through the quilt world. And, um, and, you know, we're all different, you know, we all, you know, come from different backgrounds and yet we all share this passion. We all love the quilt, whether it's yeah. traditional or art or whatever it is, we all have that. We've all been bitten by the bug and <laughs> love this, uh, love this passion of quilt making. Exactly. You alluded to having two homes. I do. And so tell me the studios in each, or do you have a studio in each of your homes? So I do have a studio in California. Um, that home, um, we were able to add on a studio. It didn't really have a space. And so that was really an incredible blessing and project to be able to build a studio. Um, so I have a really nice space in California. In Virginia, it's a little trickier because uh, there's still a lot of family that lives with us. And so there really isn't a dedicated studio. I have a place where my sewing machine is, um, but there's other purposes in that room. So it's harder for me to call it a studio, but I do have a sewing space uh, in Virginia, but I tend to do more of my really significant work when I'm in California. I have more downtime, a little bit less going on around me. Uh, so I, I find that I do, you know, if I've got a big project that I'm working on for an exhibition, I tend to do that work in California. And in California, you have a big design wall and all of I that. have a huge design wall and it, it it's just, it, yes, and I love it. Um, I, especially the way I work with these cathedral window quilts, right at what, you know, the series that I'm working on now, um, I have to have a design wall because I have to be able to pin up as I'm working. I have a, you know, I usually draft my design, an, you know, an initial concept, but then, you know, once you get it up on the design wall, then you realize, you know, you need to change it all around. So, uh, yes, I have a really nice design wall in California. I have a design wall here in Virginia too. It's just that it's not as big and there's a, you know, a lot more clutter around it. It's hard mm -hmm. to get to it. Well, when you have a house full of people, family and yeah. you know, little, little grandson. Yeah, and little grandson who lives with us. Yep. Yeah. So that's good. Yeah. I find a design wall is no matter how well you draw it out or draft it up until you see it in the actual fabrics and how the light reflects on the different. Yep textures and stuff it's it's great yeah. so who has influenced you in 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 the art world or in the quilt world who who do you look up to or follow with their artwork so you know as i look back um you know definitely a couple names come to mind i think we have to talk about yvonne because she was such an important part of our um well she she's the founder of studio art quilt associates um, and I do love her aesthetic, you know, I love the way she worked with her bright colors, but also Yvonne really was instrumental in me finding meaning in quilt making. She, you know, she was, she had an active faith and she, you know, incorporated that into her work, into her artist statements. Um, and so I really learned a lot from her in terms of, you know, being true to who you are and, you know, making the work that makes you happy, um, but also, you know, just finding meaning in the quilt making and also just, you know, her interpersonal relationships and how 
what a great friend she was to, to so many people. And another person is Vicki Pignatelli. Um, Vicki is the founder of Sacred Threads. Oh, yeah. And Sacred Threads has become a very big part of what I do. I'm now the chair of Sacred Threads. And in fact, I took it over from Vicki in 2009. So it's been over 10 years ago. Um, Vicki is another one. She's a tremendous artist. And she has a, just a beautiful story of why she started Sacred Threads, because she was making work that had a spiritual artist statement. And she got, there was a judged show that she got some very harsh critical comments and it didn't really add up to her, it didn't make sense. And she felt that it was really that the, the judge didn't like her spiritual um, statement. So she started Sacred Threads to create a safe place, a safe exhibition where artists that are making really personal work with personal stories could share their work in an appropriate environment. And I started making quilts as a reflection of my faith very early on in my quilt journey in the early 2000s. And a friend of mine told me about Sacred Threads, hey, you should enter this exhibit. And so I did and got into the 2007 exhibit. And that was the first quilt show I ever entered. <laughs> and so that and as you know you know that's a big hurdle to get over when you first start out it's like you know people tell you you should do it and you don't want the rejection and no I'm not good enough you know there's a lot of self-doubt but um, this great friend uh, Cindy Zaki's really encouraged me to enter and so I did and went to Columbus met Vicki you know she was speaking at the Sacred Threads and I was just blown away by her vision for the organization and then I volunteered to help and um, got involved and then ended up taking it over a couple of years later but she um, I got to know her really well and she's another one she just really inspires me and also you know tremendously talented um, though some of the works that she's made are, are incredible um, and then there's you, Katie, <laughs> you're another one on my list. And in fact, the quilt that I made for Sacred Threads that got into 2007 has ghost layers in it. It's oh, the yeah. transparencies. And um, again, my friend Cindy Zaki's when I was starting out, she had your book. Oh, she had taken a class with you and she had your book and she said, I think you should borrow this book. I think you really could use this. You, you could really learn a lot about value. And it's through your book that I learned the whole seven step method. Yep. And the quilt that I made that got into Sacred Threads in 2007 has those transparencies in it. It's different. It's not a color wash like your book had. It's different. Um, but it absolutely was from, from that book. Um, but also what you've inspired me is the way that you continue to work on new series that you will, you know, you will move on, <laughs> you will run a series to its end and then you'll decide that you, you want to do something new. And I love looking at your work, the retrospectives, where you can see over the years, you know, some of the things that you've done over the years. Well, over the years, I, I looked on my calendar and my first quilt, official quilt was in 1978. So I hate to say how many years <laughs> how many I've been doing this. So yeah, yeah you, have to, you have to change to keep yourself uh, interested and excited. Um, can you think of ways that quilts, like what, what do you like to do with your quilts? Do you just make them to enter? Do you do them as gifts. I know you do uh, spiritual ones for the sacred threads. What other things do you see quilts being used for? So I have made quilts for different purposes. I do make some quilts for my family. You know, I've made some lap quilts. I've never made a bed quilt. Um, maybe someday I'll make a bed quilt, but I have made a bunch of lap quilts because yeah. uh, I kind of picture my family, you know, getting wrapped up with them while they're sitting on the couch. Um, and I've made some baby quilts, but
But one of my real passions is making quilts for hospitals. Mm -hmm. And that is another project, another very influential person in my life was a quilt teacher named Judy House. And back in 2004, I took a class from her. She was teaching art quilts at our local quilt shop. And I had really just started quilting. So it was very early in my quilting journey. And she had breast cancer, was fighting breast cancer and was being treated at um, Walter Reed Army Medical Center. And she decided that she wanted to do a project to invite quilt artists to make quilts based on the plants and animals used in cancer treatments and chemotherapies. Mm -hmm. And she invited me to make one of the pieces. And there are some big names, Sue Benner, Ruth McDowell. I mean, there were some very big names of people that she invited to make pieces. Uh, so she invited me to, to participate in that. And so I made a piece. I made it based on the feverfew plant, which is used in, um, in various cancer treatments. So sh sadly, she passed away before that project finished. She, the deadline was in August and she passed away in July. Mm. And so uh, Cindy, Zachis, and I both stood up to say, we're going to finish this project. And so we worked with her husband to make sure that that project came to fruition and the, the quilts got installed at Walter Reed per her original. And we got them framed. And after she passed away, I really saw the power of that based on the feedback that the nurses gave us and just, you know, feedback we got from the patients. Um, I realized, you know, this is really, there, there's a rich area of here. We just know that there are cancer centers all over that have the same issue where these waiting areas and the treatment rooms are just sterile and they're, they're just not welcoming. And so I, um, with a group of friends, we started doing these types of projects and now we've got quite a few and I've now brought it under the umbrella of sacred threads because it's consistent with the healing mission. So I have made quite a few quilts now that are hanging in hospitals all over the country, which is really gratifying and very exciting. And some of them, we've continued to do uh, landscape quilts that are based on plants and animals used in cancer treatments to use, you know, pharmaceutical plants. But we've also done some other ones. We did a really exciting one we did was a collaboration with scientists at the University of Michigan who are studying stem cells. Mm -hmm. And they took, uh, or they take photographs under the microscope, you know, they capture these super cool images. I mean, most of us have seen these really you know, interesting biological uh, images. So we were given access to this library of images that were all from the STEM Center Research Organization at Michigan. And we made, I think, you know, between 30 and 40 pieces that traveled around the country to various hospitals. And now they're permanently installed at the University of Michigan in the hospital. And they are super cool. You see the original photograph that the scientists took, and then you see the art quilt that was made as a, you know, as inspiration from that photograph. Um, and then the scientific information, oh, this is mouse guts, and this is used, we're studying, you know, this particular disease. And um, so, you know, people, patients, as they're walking by, they have a little bit of time to kill. It's wonderful, those really cool images and then this you know, really nice little educational component as well. And we have one exhibit now that's traveling called Backyard Escape. And we put the call out to Sacred Threads artists to make pieces that are um, 18 by 24, so not really huge. And they have already rotated from National Institutes of Health and then we have, we still have a set at the University of Chicago Medicine, the hospital there in, at, in Chicago. And then we have a set right now at the University of Michigan. And um, so, and the feedback we get is, is really special. I mean, patients really appreciate having beautiful artwork 
that, you know, because it's hard, you know, being in the hospital is hard. And so yeah. having artwork in the hospital. So you were asking me where I've made quilts for. So a lot of my quilts that I make are for those hospital projects, uh, which has been really fun. Well, you are one busy lady. I know that you're still helping out with Sakwa. Yeah. And You've got your sacred threads and these hospital quilts. And how do you balance your family, your time quilting, traveling, all of these things? I know the last year we haven't been able to go to the conferences and places, but yeah. on a regular time, how do you balance all of these things that you are so passionate about? You know, I think balance is just such a, it's such a great topic because I think it is something that we all deal with. Um, you know, I think, I'm not sure my family would think I put them first. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm not a particularly good housekeeper or cook. <laughs> so I am really, really fortunate that my husband does all of the cooking. And uh, so that helps balance a lot. I'm very lucky because I think a lot of women do not have that luxury that I really do have. So I am very fortunate. So that, that makes a huge difference. And then also if I'm traveling for these various things, I mean, we haven't done much traveling lately, but you know, in previous years I was going to, you know, Sockwell Conference, Quilt Alliance Board Meeting, Quilters Take Manhattan, I mean, all sorts of events. My husband is able to kind of hold down the fort. So that, that makes a big difference. But in terms of balancing you know, the Sakwa committee work that I still do and Cult Alliance and Sacred Threads, I realize that I like to be busy. Mm -hmm. You know, not, you know, we all have different kind of capacities and I find that I have to have a lot of balls in the air to keep the energy level up. So one of the things about COVID that was really interesting for me is that when all the balls come down and I had to find balance and peace and joy without being so busy. And it was really an interesting, it was almost a spiritual kind of journey to get to this place where I don't need to be so busy. I don't need to be running all the time. I can be really content and happy with having a lot less going on. And um, in some ways I really feel like I'm in a good place and I'm kind of liking this new balance. It's like, I'm not sure I want to go back to being quite as busy as I was before. I think I want to still do all the meaningful work, but I'm not sure I want to be traveling quite as much as yeah. I was because I was teaching like you, yeah. uh, not quite as much as you, but teaching a lot. And, um, you know, it's a lot. Teaching yeah. is a lot. And it's so it's been interesting. My priorities are shifting a little bit and I've enjoyed having more time with my grandson on my lap reading and um, and having more time to make quilts. Honestly, I, uh, I made a lot of lap quilts last year. And in previous years, I was really focused on this exhibition or this hospital project or, you know, but now last year I made quite a few lap quilts. It was really fun just to make quilts that make me happy for our, our couch or somebody else's. Yeah. It's been good. I think that uh, a lot of people are going to find that um, COVID has changed the way they're going to look at the world from now on. I know my first uh, teaching job is coming up in two weeks and I'm like, oh gosh, where's all my stuff? How do you buy a plane ticket? I mean, I've forgotten so much, but also, like you said, you, you found a new way of going through your life. And um, I think it's like everything we're going to have to balance, you know, mm -hmm. the new normal is not going to be the old normal. Yeah. So anyway, do you, I think that that was brilliant. I loved hearing about your quilts. Do you have anything else that you would like to add? I mean, we couldn't have covered everything, but um, I'm just fascinated with your cathedral windows. I love watching that behind your head. <laughs> <laughs> I can't think of anything else. Okay, well, well I feel like we covered a lot of good ground. Yeah, we did. I, I really enjoyed it. It's good to see you virtually, you. and hopefully we'll be able to see each other face-to-face -face soon. Yes. Thank you, Thanks, Katie.
Well, I, I have watched that interview a number of times and um, it certainly doesn't get old to me yet. I think really only a quilter could see the beauty in um, a microscope photo of mouse guts. And also I have known Lisa for, I think almost eight years now, that may not be true, maybe longer, um, but quite a, quite a bit of time. And I learned so much about her just watching that uh, interview and um, all the projects that you're involved with, Lisa, that are working on behalf of sort of the healing power of quilts. And so I'm going to ask Lisa and Katie to join me now, um, if you all are out there. Fantastic. Wonderful. Oh. And yeah, I, thank you so much for, for joining us today and for that fantastic interview. And we've got a bunch of questions from everyone. Um, but I wanted to start first by asking you all just about the process of the, of the interview. Um, Lisa, what that felt like for you to talk about your life and quilts kind of from a bird's eye view. And Katie, you were a really wonderful interviewer. Um, how, I'm curious how you approached that role and um, you know, how did you prepare, if at all? Because you all have known each other for, for a long time, I know. So um, whoever wants to, to start with that. Lisa? Well, it was great super fun. Um, you know, one thing that's interesting is when you sort of try to put it all together in one like half an hour, it's kind of interesting and looking back on it. Um, but it was super fun. Of course, I love Katie. So it was very fun to, you know, have a conversation. And I think Katie, um, you know, your questions were really poignant for me, which I really appreciated it. You did such a great job of allowing me to talk about the things that are really important to me. Um, so it was really, it was, it was a great experience. I loved it. It was super fun. And it's super fun looking back on it to see what we talked about. Yeah, because when you're doing it, you don't, I was like, I was listening to some of your answers. Like I was busy trying to think of the next question to ask, but I didn't really prepare much because I know you so well. And I know these quilts that, and, and I know that you have a strong personality and know how to talk about your work. So it was just trying to think of something that would just keep egging you on to tell us more. It was really fun, I agree. Yeah, it was fun. Fantastic, well, it was fun to watch and I think it was evident. We've conducted a lot of QSOS interviews and sometimes the people are just meeting for the first time um, that day and sometimes they have known each other for years. And I think it's a, it's a certain kind of interview when someone already knows someone and can kind of um, knows where the heart of the matter is. So it was, it was really fun to watch and I think that comes through. So um, we have a ton of audience questions, I'm happy to say. So there were a bunch of questions, Lisa, for you about your cathedral window quilts. Um, a couple about working with silk specifically and also just your cathedral window um, uh, technique. Could you talk okay. a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, let's start with a silk question. So when I made the smaller quilt for Yvonne, uh, for Pokey Bolton's Live Your Brightest Life, it was the first time I'd ever worked with silk and I did not know about the raveling issue. <laughs> and I actually was making that at a retreat at my home and everybody's project was filled with silk bits. <laughs> it was everywhere, floating in the air on everybody's clothes. It got everywhere. It was such a mess. So of course the friends that were with me said, oh, you need to stabilize the back. You need to put, you know, like a uh, interfacing or something on the back. So I used a product, it was called French Fuse. It's very lightweight. It's, it's kind of feels like a little bit of a knit and it's got a fuse on it. Uh, so when I made the one that you saw in the inter interview, not the quilt behind me, but the silk one that was um, during the interview, I did use the French views and it made a huge difference. So going forward, anytime I work with silk, I will definitely uh, you know, do that stabilization uh, step. It's a lot more work because it's one more thing you have to do because you do it before you cut out your pieces, uh, but it was definitely worth it. It made a huge difference. And so on the construction technique, is that what the question is? Yeah, just you mentioned that you do yours a little bit differently. I'm wondering if you could talk about that. Sure, so I do them all on the machine. Um, I decided after I started playing with the way that my grandmother made a cathedral window block, I call that now the origami method, where you start with a really big square and you fold it up. The problem with that is you don't get as many um, 
opportunities for fabric because mostly the muslin is what you see and then the only brightness is in the windows. So I looked for a way of making this on the machine and I actually thought it would be easier since I saw the question while we were talking. This is a sample quilt and if you look you can more easily see one block that looks like just the circle. So that's one block. So it's made up of these sort of petal shapes and then the arcs and then the window. And I can just tell you really quickly, um, this is what a block looks like before you put the window down. These are the flaps. And it's all done on the machine where you start with a folded, start with a square, and then you have these folded flaps. I don't know if you can see that it's a little bit hard, but you fold them um, and then you just sew it all on the machine and then you put the window in and then you fold the flaps back and sew the flaps down. Um, obviously this isn't a tutorial on how to make it, but it just gives you a kind of a little bit of an idea that it's all done on the machine. It's all done based on, two, in, in this case, two and a half inch squares. So I have buckets and buckets of two and a half inch squares already cut out that I use when I'm making my pieces. Wow, that's amazing. That's a lot of squares. <laughs> um, we have two other two questions for both of you, or a question for each of you. Um, if you could talk about the quilts behind you, Lisa, I think I, we'd love to hear a little bit about yours and Katie, the quilt behind you as well. So Lisa, if you wanna start. Okay, so this was actually the first large cathedral window quilt that I made. I call it Radiance. I made it in 2016 and I was just becoming president of Sakwa. And I realized that I had not made anything for an exhibition. I was so busy doing volunteer work that I'd really kind of stopped making quilts. And I thought, you know what? As president of Sakwa, I want to be walking the same journey as everybody else. So I'm going to set a goal and I'm going to make a large quilt. So this is 80 by 80. I'm going to make a large quilt and I'm going to submit it to an exhibition because I haven't done this in so long. And here it's so important. We talk about it and um, I want to be in the same journey with all of the members that I love. And so this, I set out to make this quilt. It took me six months and, um, and I loved every bit of the process, but it really was the first one that I made using this, what I call the mock cathedral window block where I did it all on the machine. Uh, it weighs 15 pounds. It's, uh, it's so much fabric, it's really heavy. Um, but yeah, it was, a, it was a tremendous joy to work on it. And then after I made this one, I thought, okay, I'm into this now. And this, is, this was the first one in the series. So I've continued on in making them. So. Awesome. It's beautiful. Thank you. And yeah, Katie, we've got some questions about the quilt behind you as well. Oh, wait, you might be muted though. Oh. Okay, yeah. There we go. Okay. I also um, work in series and the quilt behind me during the previous interview was the first in this new series that's based on an acrylic painting that I do. Um, they're about 50 by 60. I do a big painting. I have the canvas just taped up onto my wall in my paint studio. Do a painting and then um, make that painting into a quilt but the whole painting was a little scary so I cut it into five inch blocks and I make each little block to relate to the square in the painting I put a plastic with the grid on it and so I you know do I, I do little French knots and things for where I splattered paint I'm sitting embroidering at night for the first time I love that about this that at night I could continue working without being up in my studios upstairs. So go down and watch TV, be with my dogs and stuff. So this is the third in the series and I'm working on putting, getting enough of them together to do a um, one woman show with them. Fantastic. And so we did have a question about um, a one person show for you. Uh, you mentioned, Lisa had a question in the interview about how many quilts you thought she might need for a show. You said about eight to 10 and someone wanted to know if, if size is a consideration um, when you have a, an eight to 10 pieces for a one person show. 
Yeah, it, it you know it'll differ depending on what gallery. I'm um, talking with the Nebraska Museum mm -hmm. and the size of the room that they were going to possibly offer me. They said eight to ten medium sized quilts. So I kind of assumed that that would be eight to 10 this size, 60, 50 by 60, but it depends on the space and the gallery you're gonna be going into. I think to put a proposal together to have a show, you need to have you know, quite a few pieces that they can see that it's your voice and you're doing you know, a great job with it. And that's something that they want to present. So I would say eight to 10, but you, know, you could have a smaller space and depends on the sizes as well, but you don't want it too cluttered. So a lot of little pieces often does not show as well. Um, and, and you both did talk about in the interview that you work in series and that you've done other series. Lisa, you've mentioned you've done a few other series before. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, um, I mean, you, you'd say why you like it, but, but other series that you've done and when you feel like you know that it's time to end a series and move on to something else. It's really a question for both of you, but we'll start with Lisa. I did a series, I'm still working in the series actually. So it isn't that it's really done. It's just that my interest has shifted. Um, but I, I think Katie mentioned that she sometimes goes back to a series. Um, I have a whole series right now based on the drunkards path block where I started with a traditional drunkards path but then using Photoshop and creating filters. I've warped the block in a lot of different ways. So I have a series of those that are really fun and interesting. And I, I actually am also continuing to go back to that. I'm all, you know, in my head, I'm always, you know, you know, I have my notebook where I keep track of ideas. So I'm not done with that series yet. I'm definitely focused on my cathedral windows, but I'm also not done with my warped uh, drunkard's path quilts. I've also done a lot with trees. I've made a lot of tree quilts over the years. So there, that's another series that I have. I like the idea of going between these things sort of as they come in and out of your your life and your interests. Yeah. yeah. I find um, that I work on a series and because I'm a teacher that I work on a series until I, I've really figured it out. Then the next step is I teach that as a class until I figure out what other people need to know about what I think I know. Um, and then I write a book about it. So a lot of my series have ended in a book. Like I, my first was the mandala based on the mandala format and fractured landscapes and just different things that once I've done it for so long and taught it for so long, I feel confident in writing a book about it. So, um, and again, I do go back sometimes and visit. Sometimes I need a new quilt for a class and we'll make something in that class that came from the series. So, you know, it's not, nothing's de defined as you can only make six or as I don't ever feel that they're really done done, but it's time to move on or I get another idea that I get excited about. Yeah, that's great. Um, and we have quite a few questions about your quilts and hospitals program, Lisa. Um, a few folks are interested in maybe participating. So if you could tell us if there's a way that they can find out more information, but also um, about sort of the specifics of making hospital quilts. Are there any, is there anything you need to consider? Um, are there specific sizes that hospitals tend to prefer or any other sort of, um, I guess, uh, parameters of, for making hospital quilts? The, so let me, the first way to find out about it is to sign up for the Sacred Threads newsletter because anytime we do a new project, that's where we'll advertise it. So um, on the sacredthreadsquilts.com website on the homepage down at the bottom, you can subscribe to our newsletter. So when we just recently did the Backyard Escape call for entries, that went out through the Sacred Threads newsletter. And so everybody that participated in that, that's how they found out about it. So that, that's the best way. Um, you know, the, the quilts and hospitals is a very big topic, and um, there are a lot of ways of contributing quilts to hospitals. You know, the infusion where they collect quilts to be given to somebody who's just starting an infusion and, you know, a comfort quilt. Um, there's all sorts of charities and guilds that are doing those types of projects. The ones that I've been involved in are mostly about putting art quilts, and I use the word art not to mean not traditional, but more it's on the wall and it's smaller. And these are in hallways, 
in treatment rooms and waiting areas. Those projects are a little trickier to get off the ground because hospitals have a lot of their own administration and I'll use the word bureaucracy. Um, there is bureaucracy and it takes some leadership to be able to kind of get a foot in the door to figure out who the people are. Um, and it takes time. I was really fortunate that at University of Michigan, they already had a very mature gifts of art program. And so all I really needed to do was to reach out and get to know the person that was already doing that. They were already interested and had gallery space and they were already set up for it. Um, at our local hospital here in Fairfax, uh, it was really starting from scratch. And it took me probably five years of meetings and convincing and um, to finally get a project off the ground. But once we did, then it really picked up and grew and now it's going really well. Um, so it, it takes some tenacity. It takes some phone calls and tenacity uh, to get that project, that type of project off the ground. Um, but there are lots and lots of charitable organizations that are collecting quilts, comfort quilts for cancer patients and for the NICU units. And, you know, there's just lots of opportunities to use our quilt making uh, to make the hospitals better. Fantastic. Well, yeah, I encourage everyone to um, visit Sacred Threads website, sign up. We will put a link in the chat and um, also a link to Katie's website. Katie, yes. And uh, a number of people have said that they've taken classes with Katie and use Katie's books. So I just want to shout them out and shout out Katie. Thank you so much for um, being a wonderful quilt maker and a, a wonderful interviewer um, for this project. Great. And let's see, we have time for just a, a couple more questions. Um, Karen asks, uh, Lisa, about your cathedral windows, if you had an artist statement for any of those quilts. She says, what is your artist statement for this quilt? But I'm not sure what quilt was on screen at the time. So we'll just, we'll expand. Yeah, I mean, it's usually, in, in this case, um, it's usually just really about the, uh, the color story. You know, this one, I call it radiance. It's got the obvious kind of the spiral. Um, it's also, you can't quite tell because you're just seeing a smaller version of it. Um, but it has the entire color wheel. So down at the bottom are all the purples and the blues. So this one was really, the artist statement is really around color play, understanding color palette, and also with values. Um, I think the most poignant artist statement was the one that I did for Yvonne, uh, because that one was really about her celebrating her life, celebrating her artistic style, her aesthetic, um, you know, just appreciating who she was. And again, you know, the Pokies, the name of her exhibit was Live Your Brightest Life. And that was Yvonne. And so that artist statement is probably the one that's the most poignant for me uh, because I made that in honor of her. Fantastic. Well, that's a lovely tribute to her. And I think anyone who's seen her or her work um, recognizes just how much that kind of colorful explosion of color really was Yvonne's work but also her personality mm -hmm. um so it's really it's lovely well i want to thank you both so much and thank everyone for joining us um we are going to just i'm gonna sh share my screen for a few last minute reminders here one moment big switcheroo here um i do want to remind you all that if you enjoyed hearing lisa's quilt story and you are interested in sharing one of your own um, we are collecting three minute quilt videos. Go tell it at the quilt show is what we usually call it, but we won't be at a quilt show. Um, we'll be at home showing our quilts. So it's the same idea. Um, you can find out more information at quiltalliance.org slash quilt stories. And even if you don't want to share a quilt, um, we hope you'll join us for a watching party. Um, I think it'll definitely be a Kleenex affair. There will be moving stories, joyful stories, um, inspiring stories. So, so definitely consider joining us for that if you'd like. Um, oops. And um, if you love Quilt Stories, we also encourage you to consider joining the Quilt Alliance. We're a member supported organization. Uh, membership starts at $30 a year, which is $250 a month, which is, you know, less than a fat quarter, less than thread. I mean, it depends on where you shop. But um, we definitely would love to have you as a member and, and you can learn more about the work that we do and the interviews we do um, at quiltalliance.org. 
And finally, I want to thank our partners for Textile Talks as well as our sponsors. Um, truly would not be possible without them. And we're so delighted that our community has this kind of free resource weekly um, through the pandemic when we couldn't be together and, and beyond. So um, thanks so much for everyone. And thank you all for joining us. And we'll see you next week for the next text talk. And thanks again, Lisa and Katie. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye.